Welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in to our last I'm not coming. Hags meeting before before the summer vacation. Uh, couple couple I'm, announcements. I'm staying here. Okay. Couple announcements. Uh, again, uh, please get your PG number in before 640. That'll be the cutoff in the chat to all. Uh, also, uh, anybody who would like to present to uh, HAGS, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, any good uh, geologic or other stories? Uh, we're looking for speakers for the fall and the, uh, and the spring. So let Amy or Bill Brock or me or Mike know, please. Uh, also, this would be typically a meeting where we would elect officers. Uh, I think I mentioned it at the last meeting, if there were any uh, nominations. I'm not sure how we would do that in, in this setting. Uh, I don't know if anybody has a nomination. Maybe they could put it in the chat. Uh, I think the current officers are probably prepared to uh, to press on and uh, maybe we deal with it in the fall, uh, which heard today that uh, if you've been vaccinated, you can go anywhere without a mask, except in airplanes and trains. Uh, so then the question comes to, uh, should we start to, uh, do in-person meetings, we'd like to know your opinions on that. I don't exactly know how, maybe again in the chat, but I actually kind of enjoy this, uh, this venue. Uh, I think the best part of it is we don't have to impose on speakers to travel distances. And uh, we can all do this from the comfort of our living room, but uh, the officers will probably speak to each other about, are we going to come back to in-person meetings in the fall? And uh, we'll keep you in, in tune on that. So uh, okay. for, for the, uh, the reason you're here is Rosanna Bear has agreed to, to uh, present a talk. Rosanna's presented to us before. Uh, Rosanna has been very helpful in, excuse me, I guess it's supper time and next door. <laughs> okay. Uh, Rosanna, Rosanna received her BA at Oberlin College, her master's at New Mexico. She's worked at the Pennsylvania Survey for uh, probably 14 years. Uh, she's recently became the Carson sinkhole staff on in the geology division. Surprisingly, she admits to beginning caving only five years ago. So that's a, that's a surprise. But that notwithstanding, uh, the story she's got looks pretty fantastic about the caves in Virginia. And I'm looking forward to seeing what she's got. I have it on uh, good source that this is, she's gonna take this talk on the road to present at the GSA uh, in the future. So uh, thanks again, Rosanna, for uh, volunteering and hopefully this will help you hone your craft here. Okay. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you very much, Kent, for the introduction. And thanks to everybody for tuning in this evening. So tonight's talk, um, it's news to me, I'm going to GSA. This was a poster 
um, March 2020, which didn't happen. But um, I'm really glad I get to present it to you guys tonight. Oh, I'm sorry if uh, if I uh, misspoke. <laughs> we have spies finding posters around. No, uh -oh. I'll have to catch <laughs> up with them. Okay. So the, the title is Over, Under, and Through, a three-prong approach to field mapping a karst terrain of Western Virginia. And I thought, what a better way to share the 2021 International Year of Caves and Karst than to share about one of the official national landmarks national natural landmarks, which is Butler and Breathing Caves in Burnsville Cove in Western Virginia. So th this project is really a labor of love by weekend warrior geologists and cavers, just working to increase the understanding of these and other caves in the Burnsville Cove. The initial goal was, was pretty small. It was simply to create an accurate cross-section through a passage known as Pat section of Butler's Cave. But the project grew in scope as structural data were collected along several transects in Butler Cave on the surface and as additional cavers collected cave data in nearby caves. In 2019, the LIDAR digital elevation models became available and provided additional opportunities for remote data collection. So this three-prong approach has increased our understanding in this area in Western Virginia. Now the Burnsville Cove is located in Bath and Highland counties of Western Virginia in the Valley and Ridge province. And you will note the, um, the Great Valley. Oh. Uh, coming down from Pennsylvania, right, we have South Mountain, and then it um, goes on down into the Blue Ridge and Shenandoah. So basically, you're just going to head south on 81 and hang a right turn in Stanton. So this is a topographic map of the Burnsville Cove. Uh, north is to the top right, and the scale is uh, two miles total. The cove is loosely defined as the area between Jack Mountain, Tower Hill Mountain, the town of Burnsville, and the Bull Pasture Gorge. So Jack Mountain, Tower Hill Mountain, the town of Burnsville, the Bull Pasture Gorge, and then also water sinks, which is a really neat feature. Uh, I'll get into more. The Butler Cave Conservation Society was founded 53 years ago, and it's dedicated to conservation, exploration, survey, preservation, and scientific study of the, co of the caves in and around this area. So switching to a bird's eye view, uh, the valley back there in the west with the town of Bolar is a breached anticline with uh, Ordovician carbonates down in the base. Jack Mountain is held up by the Tuscarora sandstone. And then this valley in the foreground, right, with Burnsville and the Bull Pasture Gorge and the water sinks. Uh, the valley is multiple secondary folds, possibly some faults, with some exposed Silurian to Devonian carbonates and some siliciclastics. In the foreground here is Tower Mountain Hill, which is held up by the Kiefer sandstone. And then behind us is younger and younger Devonian shales. Over 100 caves and more than 72 miles of surveyed passages exist in this area, largely in the Tanala Way, but some in the Kaiser and the Oriskany. So there was earlier mapping in uh, 1962 on the one to 62,000 scale. 
Uh, George Dyke in 1961 really got into the stratigraphy within breathing cave. And then more recently, John Haynes at James Madison University and some of his students, Chris Sweezy of the USGS, Rick Lambert, Phil Lucas, and, and many others have been working to uh, contribute to this. Now this map is uh, by Sweezy et al from 2017. The folds plunge to the Northeast. And again, here's Jack Mountain and Tower Hill Mountain. So we're gonna focus on the Sinking Creek Syncline plunging to the Northeast and the Chestnut Ridge Anticline. Um, the colors on the map are, are based on the rock type. So yellows are sandstones, blue is limestone, gray and brown are shale. And the stratigraphy of the area may seem very familiar to the Pennsylvania geologists. We have the Tuscarora, Rose Hill, Kiefer, the Mackenzie, which we have as a member of the Mifflin Town Formation, the Wills Creek, Tenalaway, the, the Helderberg, which historically we used, now we call it Kaiser and parts of the Old Port. There's the Oriskany and the Needmore, uh, which was a member of the Onondaga, now recognized as its own formation in Pennsylvania, and the Millboro, which aka the Marcellus. So the only one I breezed over here is this Williamsport sandstone. Because there's a bunch of other sandstones. Um, so this really grainy image is from DHO uh, 1986, an SCPM field trip guide. And it's a transect from south to north in Western Virginia into West Virginia. And the area we're interested in is really the, the muddy run and the bull pasture gorge. But notice these tongues of sandstone um, are typically thicker to the south. Now the, the Tuscarora we know and the Kiefer, right, which comes up into Pennsylvania. Um, but new to Pennsylvania geologists are these thin interfingering sandstones within the Mackenzie, the Tenalaway, and, and not shown even on up into the Kaiser, their Clifton Forge member is a sandstone. Now you'll notice um, above the Mackenzie, we have this Williamsport formation. And it's a, a sandstone, likely sourced from the south. And it's about six feet thick, um, which you know doesn't seem like it should pop out as a formation, but there's great marker beds. So it's very easy to trace when you're, when you're in the field. Now these sandstones confounded some of the earlier mappers because there, there are so many of them and the only ones really historically reported on were the Clifton Forge and the Williamsport. But some of these recent uh, work done by Chris Sweezy and John Haynes and company through this detailed stratigraphic study have worked out the stratigraphic framework. Now in Pennsylvania, we don't have those sandstones except the Tuscarora and the Kiefer. And we do have the, the Wills Creek and Bloomsburg as silts and shales. So, and, and they don't have the Bloomsburg. But the thing to note is really at the end of the Silurian to Devonian, you establish this large, stable carbonate bank with over 300 feet of limestone accumulating with occasional incursions from those sandstones. Now this bank is so stable that the members of the formations are the same from New Jersey to Pennsylvania to Virginia, right? If you're familiar with the Kaiser, we have the Byers Island, the Jersey Shore and the LaVale and the Helderberg, uh, which is our old port and Kaiser, the New Creek, the Corriganville, the Shriver and the Licking Creek. I mean, this is a stable carbonate bank and in places has some really great fossils. And it's really between the sandstones of the Tenalaway and in the Kaiser and Oriskany that these caves are well-developed. 
So shown here from uh, Sweezy et al. 2017, you see the man-made entrance to Butler Cave. And you can see um, a sandstone labeled LBCS, and that is lower breathing cave sandstone. And on the strat column, there's also the upper breathing cave sandstone. And that's because they were first identified as the floor and the ceiling of breathing cave. Now within Butler Cave, we continue to have these two sands. Um, this is a profile view. And, and it also sort of shows you the, the influence that these sandstones have on cave formation. That uh, upstream of the dry sumps, the, the cave is really pinned underneath one of those sandstones until it could punch through and then it was above the sandstone. So the early settlers in the area knew about some small caves in the area. Uh, some were used for habitation and others were used for the extraction of saltpeter. During the Civil War, um, the Confederate military forces exploited the saltpeter caves to get niter to make gunpowder uh, because of the blockades that were put on the ports. So they knew about the caves, you know, in, in the 1860s. The 1901 topographic map does show large closed depressions. And in the 1917 Annals of Bath County by Owen Morton, he reports that the town of Burnsville was also known as Red Holes. It's unclear whether Red Holes comes from the reddish loam in the sinkholes or the fact there were also artificial salt licks there that were red. So this area is known for its karst. Um, one of the great examples of karst in the area is the springs. This is Cathedral Springs on the bank of the Bull Pasture River within the Bull Pasture Gorge. The creek is flowing from right to left in front of us, and you can see the hillside through the leafless trees, and the spring is issuing forth from that. Another spring in the area is Aqua Springs. The top picture shows sort of a, a normal flow. Um, and for the, the brave, there is a cave back up in there. Um, you can see the, the person for scale behind the tree. And then the lower picture is uh, in flood stage with a lot of um, suspended solids the turbidity and you know mud in in the stormwater, and and you can see where that person was standing is now just sort of a roiling upwelling of water. Another uh, karst feature commonly seen in the area are sinkholes and closed depressions. Um, this one is the fourth largest one in the cove, and there's a house and cars for scale. Typical of a lot of karst areas, um, we also have, in addition to the sinkholes, we have swallow holes and disappearing streams. So Sinking Creek, uh, shown on the topo map, flows on the surface and disappears and reappears, depending on you know, how recent there was a heavy rain. And finally, it disappears down the water sinks. And the water sinks is a 40 foot deep swallow hole. And the photograph is taken standing on the northern bank looking south. And you kind of have that high wall of um, the Kaiser limestone. So this picture was taken in June of 2020. If we move a little to the left and one day earlier, it looked like this. So the sinking creek is in flood stage. It's coming here, it's pooling, and all of that water is going down 
this hole. Well, in karst areas, we're also fortunate to have, hopefully, caves. Uh, prior to 1958, Breathing Cave was the only large known cave in the cove, and then Butler Cave was discovered. It's now known to be 18 miles long and is ranked in the top five or six longest and deepest caves in Virginia. There's always a tug of war for positions as new passages discovered and surveyed and um, so depends on which source you check, but there, you know, it's no little slouchy cave. Uh, this photo is the entrance to Bobcat Cave, that little hole in the ground behind the, uh, the cavers. It is part of the Chestnut Ridge Cave System. This cave was discovered in the early 1980s. Um, and that little hole kind of belies the fact there are 23 plus miles of cave down there. Um, it's the third longest in the state. So the springs, the sinks, the swallow holes, the caves, there's lots of great karst features. So our three-pronged approach was to do field work, look at the LIDAR, and measure, take measurements within the cave. Knowing we would be hard pressed to improve on the stratigraphy, we focused on structural interpretations. The standard field techniques were used to collect lithologic and structural data on the land surface. Traditional field work, though rewarding, is time intensive especially for weekend warriors with other items on their agenda. The technique also faces several cha challenges. Landowner permission needs to be granted. There's ticks, there's snakes, there's bears. Weather can be a factor. Uh, this photograph is taken from within that closed depression that I showed earlier. Um, and in carbonate and shale valleys, outcrops are limited. You end up doing a lot of float mapping. And where you do find outcrop, the data tends to be biased towards the more resistant beds. Shown here is the Clifton Forge member of the Kaiser Formation. The sandstone, uh, we could take measurements on it. And so overall, our field observations helped us determine that um, near the chest, the crest of Chestnut Ridge, there's um, an outcrop of Wills Creek and the Williamsport. Now this interpretation is supported by observations of John Haynes. However, it's not on the current published maps, which are dated 2017. So there's some, some updating to, to do. Now LIDAR became available for this area in the fall of 2019. And um, in this case, I put north up, the town of Burnsville is here and Jack Mountain is over here. This is a hillshade, uh, which is commonly used. It's illuminated from the Northwest. So a lot of times your southeast facing slopes are, are dark and things are hidden there. So I really prefer the slope shade. Where in this case, the steep areas are dark and the flat areas are light colored. It's a really useful tool to prioritize field work. And when used in conjunction, you gain the best results. So you can note some resistant beds, um, joint controlled valleys, which you can't tell are joint controlled from the LIDAR, but when you measure bedding in the area and then joints, you, you figure that out. We've got some large swallow holes over here as the water comes down the mountain and disappears down the hole. 
and plenty of sinkholes. So one of the things that the LIDAR revealed is that in the northern part of the cove, the resistant beds controlled the topography. And in the southern part, closer to the village of Burnsville, um, where the lower Tanalaway is outcropping, the joints generally control the topography. Now, Will White in 2015 also reported that the joints often control the cave passages too. So zooming in on some of these um, resistant beds, you can see them sort of poking out texturally from the rest of the area. Uh, one of the things we observed was a unmapped anticline on the eastern flank of Jack Mountain. Um, several, of the, several of the folds mapped and unmapped, visible on LIDAR, are asymmetrical. Dips of the eastern limb of the anticlines appear to be steep to vertical, whereas the western limbs appear less steep. And the hinge zone typically is broad and flat. And second and third order folds can be seen, as noted by the red line at the bottom. So here we, we have a, an anticline running northeast, southwest. Textural differences in the LIDAR assist with the geologic mapping. The shale formations are smooth in texture. The sandstones form these resistant ridges. In this case, this is the Ariscany. And this is the Clifton Forge here, these little saw teeth. The limestones are pockmarked with sinkholes. And up here, this is Ariscany. And you can see sort of the, the sinkholes there are uh, shallower, they're less steep sided, but they're large and circular, and they seem to be aligned. There's a regional joint pattern they're following. Now, looking at the topographic map, this liniment on Mill Run appears to line up with water sinks, which is up here. But the LIDAR clearly indicates they are on parallel features. So just you know, some great information you can collect from the comfort of your desk. You can get the strike and dip from the LiDAR slope shade digital elevation models. We located resistant beds. You digitize three points that fall on the bed, extract the northing, the easting, and the elevation. And basically you have yourself a three point problem. Um, and here we want to give out a shout out to Gregory Springer at Ohio University, who created a spreadsheet. You plug in your three sets of northing, easting, and elevation, and it calculates the strike and dip. Well, now there's also a tool to use to do this in ArcGIS. So we had to give a shout out to Ralph Hagerund of the USGS, who wrote this script. And in this case, you digitize a line, like a marker bed, and it does the rest. The nice thing about it, it's faster. It also throws out bad lines. So of course you wanna um, pick data points that are spread out. If they're too close together or aligned along strike or dip, it'll induce errors. And his script will throw those out as not too trustworthy. Now, one thing we noticed, your field measurements tend to be on smaller planes, you know, what you can walk up to and put your brunton on. But one benefit of the LIDAR is the ability to measure large features. A bird's eye view is a different perspective. And the LIDAR is not hampered by vegetation. Data can be collected over a large area, quickly, without landowner permission, or, or dangerous encounters such as scree fields, quarries, bull pastures. Our third prong to our approach was in-cave mapping. 
So to collect data within the cave, minor adjustments are needed from your field techniques. GPSs are of no use. Accurate base maps are necessary. Now, fortunately, these are available for the cove based on over 50 years of exploration and careful surveying. There are many benefits to doing field work in the cave. In an outcrop poor or heavily vegetated area, the caves offer nearly continuous outcrop. Caves afford a view of the internal workings of the structures that only peek out at the surface. Here's some examples of small scale, complex folding, and that's just not likely to show at the surface. You also have uh, small faults, which would be easy to miss if the fault was not at the surface or the outcrop was weathered. This wasn't really the best angle for the picture, but you can see here there's a bit of a fault plane and the fault bend fold. The work can be done year round in relative comfort of 51 degrees Fahrenheit air without insects, snakes, dogs, poison ivy, all the other things that ail you in the field. Though at times, the amount of outcrop is absolutely overwhelming. Now the caves do need to be in a useful orientation across the structure, not strike parallel, right? If they strike parallel, you're just gonna keep getting the same reading, you're not getting the big picture. The caves may be wet and muddy. The walls may be coated with gypsum or other cave formations that cannot be disturbed. Uh, those of us working in the field are accustomed to knocking a corner off of something to see what's inside and that's that's rather frowned upon. Some caves require technical skills that not all geologists have, such as uh, rope work or the ability to squeeze into small passages. Now we've been very fortunate that other cavers can be recruited and to date they seem eager to assist. A Disto X laser rangefinder with built in compass and clinometer is utilized to collect the strike and dip data. It's used by non geologists since they're familiar with the tool from cave surveying. The Disto X accuracy is similar to a Brunton. And the one thing we noticed, of course, is that the in cave data is biased towards the limestones in which the caves form. So we amalgamated structural data from the field, from LIDAR and within the caves. The purple lines on this map are the cave passages. The red dots are bedding planes measured in the Sinking Creek syncline within the cave. The green are the bedding planes on the Chestnut Ridge anticline within the cave. The blue is bedding from the field that either we measured or previous mappers. We did digitize off their maps to increase our data set. And the black dots are the bedding measured from LIDAR. So here on the, the Northwest side, we have a new anticline that we mapped um, based on the LIDAR, the one I showed you up close earlier. The Sinking Creek syncline, uh, we adjusted its position slightly from previous mapping. And this green line is a cross section I'll show you next, from Jack Mountain across the valley to Tower Hill Mountain.
And there we have the uh, LIDAR based anticline. And then the Sinking Creek syncline, Chestnut Ridge anticline, White Oak syncline, which I really talk about. This is overall a first order syncline, but it has secondary and tertiary folds. And a lot of them are demonstrated within the cave. You'll notice those labels like Butler Cave Pat section, Wow Way, Main Passage and Barberry, and By the Road. We actually have underground control points so that when we're drawing our cross section, we're not completely arm waving. So now to the fun part. Uh, first, a shout out to Richard Almendinger for writing this free Stereonet software program. If you remember back to structure class, the dots are the poles to all the bedding planes. So you can think back, if you picture your hand as a bedding plane and a, a pencil placed perpendicular, clenched between your fingers is the pole to that plane. And then it's being projected down into a bowl. Now, if you picture your hand covered in little pins and you, you know, kind of mentally fold it into an anticline or a syncline, those points will be distributed. The, I'm sure you remember this from structure, the best fit great circle girdle, that line shown here in red and green, the pole to that is the axis of the syncline or anticline. And if you caught none of that, just know that the number three is the trend and plunge of the fold axis. The red plot is our structural measurements from within Butler Cave on the Sinking Creek syncline. And our primary focus in the beginning was to locate the axis of the syncline. So we spent a lot of time in the shallowly dipping beds trying to find the axis itself. Second through fifth order folds were observed. Measurements were taken on both large scale and small scale structures. And the syncline is broad, flat bottomed and slightly off from where previously published. The uh, axis, according to the map, um, trends about uh, 25.7 in the upstream third of the cave. But according to the stereo net analysis, it trends more like uh, 42 degrees. Um, so is there a kink in the axis? Is something else going on? We still need to work that out. More data. The green are measurements in the Chestnut Ridge anticline. They were collected at Buzzing Tree, Better Forgotten, Blarney Stone, and Bobcat Caves by other cavers whom were incredibly gracious towards. The majority of the data was collected on the southeast limb. That's why the majority of the poles are on the northwest side. Um, again, second to fifth order folds were observed. And the axis of the Chestnut Ridge anticline trends, um, or plunges about 6.6 .6 degrees in the direction of 23.3. So um, bedding was much steeper than anticipated in many of the areas. Um, even though the passages appear to be close to the fold hinge, right? If we expect the fold hinge to be broad and flat, like the syncline is, um, it didn't seem to be the case. Now, the bedrock mapping near the entrance of Bobcat Cave, combined with in-cave measurements and observations, seems to indicate the Chestnut Ridge anticline axial plane is not vertical, but likely northwest dipping or bedding is influenced by unidentified subsurface faults. This three-dimensional view would not be possible with a single-pronged approach. Shown here, the blue is the strike and dip of the um, field measurements plotted as poles and the axis um, plunges 1.4 degrees in the direction of 43.6. The LIDAR derived data um, which kind of covers the entire cove, it was a bit broader, um, plunges two degrees in the direction of 36, which falls between the Chestnut Ridge anticline and the Sinking Creek syncline interpretations, maybe because everything's just on one plot. So here we plot all the data at once. And 
The red is the Sinking Creek syncline. You notice it's very close to the field measurements in blue. The LIDAR is a little bit off from that. And then the Chestnut Ridge anticline is quite a ways off from that. Um, our first thought was is that we corrected the wrong way for magnetic declination, but that is not the case. And if all the data are accurate, the fact that the Chestnut Ridge anticline, green number three, and the Sinking Creek syncline, red number three, the fact they're not parallel, though they formed under the same stress field, indicates folding is more complex than first thought. And what comes to mind is a model similar to Fail and Wells' uh, famous 1974 kink band folding example. And in this case, you'll notice that this anticline crest and this syncline trough are not parallel, though they are from the same structural regime. So our, our conclusion are that the, the base, the better base maps and additional data collection is going to improve the geologic maps, uh, possibly can help us refine the structures and hopefully assist in locating new caves. Plenty of future goals trying to plot the small scale separate from the large scale, see if there's a distinction there. As always, collect more data. Um, kind of high on the list right now is figuring out if there is a fault. And then ground truthing um, the LIDAR interpretations. So onward and upward, or downward as the case may be. There's plenty of people to acknowledge um, all of those who assisted on cave trips, took measurements and photographs, provided hospitality, thought-provoking discussion, or wrote incredibly useful computer programs, and then also the owners of the caves um, that have permitted us to access them to continue exploring, mapping, and looking at the geology. So a quick side note to uh, students and professors. The Butler Cave Conservation Society's mission is to conserve, explore, survey, preserve, and conduct scientific studies in the cave and around the cove. In order to encourage scientific study in the cove, they've created the Sinking Creek Grant, which you can apply for to assist in your study in that great learning center. And in order to encourage exploration, they host geology and outing club trips. And maybe if we're interested, a uh, Hags field trip to explore the sinks and springs, the caves, and the karst terrain of the Burnsville Cove. So if anyone has any questions, now would be the time. Hey, everyone. So this, uh, we usually moderate the questions by typing them in the chat bar. Um, and so, uh, so type away. I guess while folk are, are typing, I had a quick question. Um, and that is, uh, what are like, what, what's like the fossils that you have encountered with this cave, if you have noticed any? I'm, I'm personally just interested in that. Um, so within the cave, we've noticed crinoids and gastropods. Um, and that's, I've primarily been in the Tenalaway caves. Um, but up in the Kaiser, there's a fossilized stromatoporoid reef. So, um, of course, the stromatoporoids, there's crinoids, coral, um, hexagonaria coral, and the rugose coral. Cool. Brachypods, like it's when you get, especially in the um, the Heldeberg and the Kaiser, just amazing quantity of fossils. Are there any more re more recent ones? Like uh, I don't know how many like more in the last thousand years or since the the ice age or whatnot. Um, if there's any evidence that you've popped up, uh, popped along in with that, I mean I know it's be really varied depending on the original entrance to the caves. Yeah, so 
way to make me think outside the Devonian. Uh, <laughs> they they have um, fishers, which which we still have today in Pennsylvania, but they're a northern species. Um, skeletons and tracks and scratches. Um, they just recently found a tooth that they think is a bison. Now, whether it's that like mega bison of the Pleistocene or a more recent, um, you know, pre-colonial times bison, um, they don't know yet. Um, I believe they found some bear parts, not cave bears, but um, black bears. And snails, there's always snails. Uh, let's see, we got some questions. Um, sorry, my, my bit is acting up here. So give me just a quick second. There we go. Um, let's see. Uh, in the one group photo, the or one early on, what was in the dry bags? Um, so in the the trips to Bobcat, they actually do what are called camp trips, and so this could be all your food and clothing. You know, they were wearing their climbing gear, but have additional gear, um, and they actually would go and spend like a whole week underground. So. It's everything they need. Man, a week underground, that's a long time. <laughs> I thought going through some of the big uh, tunnels in China that are underground and like being underground for like half an hour was like, this is crazy, but a week, man, oof. Uh, is there a name for the arc script for bedding from LIDAR? Yes. Um, so it's on GitHub and you can download it. And it's if you search for uh, Ralph Hagrand um, planar measurements or send me an email, I can send you the link. Wonderful. Um, finding caves, uh, so from Helen, uh, if that finding caves is an admirable goal, admirable goal but what other issues are in the area that would be helped by improved geologic mapping, like water supply, disposal, economic issues, anything other than that? So this area um, is rural and agricultural and forested. Um, there's 2,500 residents in the county. So it's, it's pretty low population. Um, water quality would definitely be a concern, um, of course, between the, the ease of access between surface water and underground and the short residence time, uh, you know, not allowing the, the water quality to be improved the way it would with slow infiltration. Um, some of the sinkholes were used as the trash dump um, and the cavers have put put forth a, a great effort in removing the trash from uh, one of the holes. They just, they bought the sinkhole and now they're cleaning out decades of trash. Uh, Kent asks, is Wills Creek a competent limestone there? It is a calcareous mudstone. And I would not call it competent. Are there any evidence uh, for when the cave passage is formed? Um, so dating the cave itself is really difficult. Um, they did just do a optical stimulated luminescent dating on the sediment within the cave. So you got to form the cave before you can accumulate the sediment. And there are gorgeous like stream banks with diamictons and cross bedded sandstones and inner fingered conglomerates, uh, sort of semi lithified. 
And the date they got off of that was 31 to 37,000 years ago. So the caves are older than that. Um, I don't know if we have a better date than that at this point. So Kent also asks, is Chestnut Ridge and Jack's Mountain the same as those in PA? No. There are plenty of Chestnut Ridges both across Pennsylvania and then West Virginia, Virginia. These don't line up directly. And this is Jack Mountain, not Jack's Mountain. Um, and it would be further, if it was in Pennsylvania, it'd be further north than our Jack's Mountain. Uh, comparing the bedrock attitudes from the surface outcrops to the subsurface outcrops, did surface outcrops float or detach any downhill? Um, at like, it, was that a concern at all? Yeah, that's always a concern in doing field work um, because I've seen blocks the size of half a Greyhound bus float well down a hill and stay upright in the process. And so you come across that and it's half buried and you're like, well, is this, this seems to be an outcrop, but um, you know, potentially it's float. So pretty much what we were seeing in the field was just um, like little fins, little knee high fins. Um, the picture I showed of the Clifton Forge was sort of, it's six feet thick, but just sort of forms that little fin um, so yeah, the, the outcrops could have floated on the surface. I'm sure we did throw out some data that was, you know, completely erratic, but even in cave, some of the measurements looked somewhat erratic, but they, they're real, especially on these secondary tertiary minor folds. Uh, Tom uh, makes note uh, that with slope shapes made from the DMs, you can see both sides of the valley, but of course, then the issue is your sense of up and down when looking at, at any of the maps, um, because, you know, it's always fun to swing uh, the sun angle around on some of those things, uh, but it can get complicated quick. Yeah, and uh, we did accidentally send somebody out to look at what turned out to be a hill instead of a hole. Um, because we were using the slope shade. Now he prefers the hill shade um, because of that, but maybe to use them in conjunction is really the best idea. It's definitely, it can be difficult with, uh, if you only stick with one type, uh, using more maps is, can often be, you know, a much more comprehensive way. I, I very much agree. Um, Kent wants to know how you did with squeezing through the confined spaces? Me? I don't do that. <laughs> if I can't oh. crawl on my hands and knees, I get nervous. And that's what those other cavers are for. And they've been super awesome about collecting data for us. It, it's definitely claustrophobic in, in some of those things. Did they show you any of their like practice boxes for going through those? Uh, not yet, no. Uh, are any quarries being investigated nearby as part of the study? Are there any nearby quarries? Well, so, so blissfully there aren't. Um, it's an hour to the nearest city of size. And so to transport um, limestone that far hasn't been, you know, hasn't been economically viable. Uh, there are some like small shale pits and road cuts. And so we do have those to investigate, but no quarries, no high walls. Um, and they did investigate putting a pipeline through there. Um, but fortunately, the natural landmarks designation helped protect the cave and a lot of logistical problems got them to reroute it out of this karst terrain.
Oh, and I see Brian added there. Um, they did some magnetic reversal studies and found um, two reversals. So assume normal and then a reverse. And the sediments there are at least 900,000 years old. You know, so we have all these like little single data points trying to put together. But uh, yeah, so the cave's got to be older than that. Wonderful. Uh, d um, oh, uh, Bill uh, asks, how are the bats doing in the area? Did you have to take any precautions to avoid spreading wet, uh, oh, sorry, white nose syndrome? So um, they do close some of the caves for certain parts of the year. Um, the ones that have historically had bats are off limits to caving in the like the winter six months. Um, unfortunately, by the time I started caving, white nose was already prevalent in the area. Uh, wonderful. Um, uh, if anyone has any uh, other questions, this is the time. Um, I think uh, Rosanna definitely uh, you got a lot of uh, kind words on on the quality of the presentation. I think this this is definitely a, a nice talk and you might very well hear from me in the future about possibly asking you to give this talk on my campus. <laughs> well, and they need a field trip too. Or yes, yes. We all need a field trip. Seriously, you do. Um, okay. Uh, oh, we, we, where we do have a, a question. Did other cavers need to swim or dive to access any of these passages? Yeah. So the downstream end of Butler Cave goes into two sumps. Um, that's where the water comes up to the ceiling and they both in the past were dove by brave and or foolhardy individuals. Um, and they extended the length of the cave. Uh, some of them, well, one of them, they, they went through the sump and got to walking passage and they continued walking and they got to another sump, um, but didn't continue past that. And so that's something we should keep checking back as, you know, as the years go by that, that possibly those will drain or if they're filled up with cobbles, the cobbles might get flushed out. Uh, but yeah, there's a couple of spots in the cove where they have done cave diving. Uh, Joel uh, shared a link in the chat. Um, so uh, if, if people take a look at the Springer book um, or follow the link, uh, that, that's a, another resource. Always good when people are sharing resources. <laughs> All right, so I think uh, I'm gonna let uh, Kent uh, get uh, back up here to close us out. Rosanna, that was great. Yeah, uh, how far away is that? You're talking about field trip. It's four and a half hours from Harrisburg okay. if nobody okay. wrecks on 81. <laughs> yeah, that's the way is it. Uh, and, and claustrophobia is definitely a factor when you're doing that kind well, of stuff. A bunch of the caves are actually just walking passage. Yeah. Or like cathedral the, size rooms, <laughs> which kind of can be well, agoraphobic. I I did a little bit of caving and uh, got stuck in one hole one time. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> if I, as long as I panicked, I couldn't get out. <laughs> but it was a wonderful talk. Great, uh, 
great ideas and uh, very interesting. And I love I love the uh, application of lidar. I love lidar. Uh, feels like it's cheating when I'm using it, but uh, again, uh, it's very useful tool. I was not aware that you could change from hillshade to some other uh, uh, direction. And I'll have to try that. But uh, appreciate your presenting for us. And uh, yeah, stimulating all our neurons and from the underground looking up instead of the other direction. So uh, thanks again. And Y'all uh, keep keep in mind, speakers. Uh, anybody else that wants to tell a good story? It was a great story. Oh, we, we, we actually we have a, a quick question, uh, a couple of questions for for Rosanna. Right right at the right at the end there. Um, so uh, Kevin uh, has uh, th uh, three questions from his second grade daughter. One, uh, why should we not put trash in sinkholes, Rosanna? Well, first of all, we should only put trash in trash cans. Um, but the problem is that a lot of trash also has chemicals and things in it. And that sinkhole is also a direct route for water to get down in the ground. And that could be somebody's well water. And so it's gonna pollute the water by putting the trash right in the spot where the water likes to go underground. The second question of what is a high wall? When you're making a quarry and you're digging a hole in the ground, that's that really steep wall at the end that uh, well shows the geologist a lot of nice rocks and shows the the quarry, you know what they're what they're taking out. And the third question from this brilliant second grader is what is sediment? And sediment is sand, gravel, cobbles, mud, any of that stuff you'd find on the bottom of a lake or a river or at the beach. Kind of logs. In these cases, some of these caves will have logs in them. That's true. Plants and such can become part of the sediment load. Thank you, Miss Bear. Well, you're welcome. That was great. Thanks a lot. All right, have a good night, everybody. Yep, all right.